Today I have kind of a different video for all of you because sitting right next to me is an all new 2018 Dodge Durango Citadel anodized platinum all wheel drive, which happens to be one of the longest vehicle names I think I've seen recently. And this also happens to be a vehicle that I just purchased. One of the benefits of my job is that when I'm out shopping for a vehicle, I do have the ability to try and review vehicles that I am actually interested in buying myself. And that's why we recently asked Dodge to borrow a 2018 Durango. They sent us a Dodge Durango RT. I bought sort of a different trim here in the Citadel Anodized Platinum. The basic difference is that this is theoretically the more luxury oriented Durango and the RT is the sportier oriented Durango. At the end of most of our video reviews, I usually tell you what my favorite vehicle in the segment is. And if you recall, the Durango has been a favorite of mine for a while, but it's not my absolute favorite three-row crossover. On the flip side, this is the three-row crossover that fit me the best, and that's exactly why I've just bought one. So let's dive into some of the video that we shot when we had the 2018 Durango RT, then we'll hop under the hood of this red one right here, we'll talk about why exactly we purchased it. The Durango is an unusual vehicle in America because this is a three row crossover. Of course, FCA likes to call it an SUV, but in the truest sense of the word, this is actually a crossover because a crossover is supposed to be a blend of car-like and truck-like features. And the Durango really is the last true crossover in America. Because if you take a look at something like a Chevy Traverse or a Toyota Highlander or a Honda Pilot, they are frankly just minivans with bigger boxes on the back and available all wheel drive. They share very little with trucks and almost everything with passenger cars and minivans. The Durango is quite different. Unlike a traditional SUV like a Chevy Suburban or a Tahoe or an Escalade, the Durango is a unibody vehicle. So there is no separate frame under the body, but we do have a large V8 engine under the hood, rear wheel drive and high tow ratings. The stout towing capacity and the drivetrain is obviously part of the truck side of the blend, as is the available two-speed transfer case with a low ratio mode, available skid plates, etc. And the car portion is the way that the vehicle drives, because the body of this vehicle and its suspension is actually in some ways more closely related to Chrysler and Dodge sedans than, of course, Ram pickup trucks. The stout tow rating of the Durango is one of the key reasons that people are buying the Durango these days, because the average crossover in America can tow maybe 4,000 or 5,000 pounds when properly equipped, but the Durango's lowest tow rating is 6,200 pounds. And if you opt for the top engine, you can get up to 8,700 pounds of towing capacity. That actually is about the same range or slightly higher than a Chevy Tahoe. Somewhat more important than the tow ratings themselves is the way that the Durango actually tows those heavier weights because the Durango is about 1200 pounds heavier than a Mazda CX-9. And although curb weight is sort of the enemy of fuel economy, it's actually a friend when it comes to towing because if you're towing 6,000 pounds behind your three row crossover, having a heavier curb weight means the vehicle is going to get pushed around an awful lot less. The biggest change for 2018 happens up front where we get a new front end look that's shared between the RT trim, which is what we're driving right here, and the top end SRT trim of the Durango. The function of the hood vents is primarily engine cooling, although it seems to do a little bit more in the SRT version than the RT version that we're driving right here. Taking a closer look at the hood, you can see that center scoop right there and then the two air exhaust vents. Again, these are functional on either side of the hood. At 201 inches long, the Durango is notably longer than something like a Toyota Highlander or a Kia Sorento, but this is about three inches shorter than a Chevy Tahoe, making it a little easier to park. It also is a little bit narrower overall than a Tahoe or an Escalade. When you look at that chart at the bottom of your screen, you'll notice that this slots sort of right between the new Mazda CX-9 and the new Chevy Traverse in terms of overall length. But there is a big difference between this and the Traverse and the CX-9, and that's in the wheelbase. You notice that front wheel is pushed very far forward, and that's because the Durango is a rear wheel drive vehicle by default all wheel drive is available as an option. The longer wheelbase also means that this is going to be a little bit better at towing than some of those other three row crossovers. If you didn't know by now, the Durango is the very close cousin to the Jeep Grand Cherokee. They share an awful lot of the structure of the vehicle. The big difference is that the Durango is a three row vehicle. So we have a third passenger area right here, meaning we have a slightly longer vehicle overall and things are a little bit square as we go to the back. 
Out back, we have this very distinctive LED accent strip that runs from one tail lamp module on over to the other. Dodge refers to this as the racetrack inspired LED strip. We have a tow hitch receiver right down there with seven pin and four pin wiring connections. And again, well integrated parking sensors around the rear bumper. Tow ratings for this vehicle come in at 6,200 pounds if you get the V6, 7,200 pounds if you get the 5.7 liter V8, which is what we're driving right here, and a whopping 8,700 pounds if you get the 6.4 liter V8 engine. That means that the Durango will actually tow more than a Chevy Tahoe. At this point, you're probably wondering, what do I tow? Is it a fifth wheel? Is it a boat? What is it? The answer is actually I tow all sorts of random things. Uh, we built our own house. I mean, literally built it. So anything that is the house, concrete, wood, uh, the shingles, everything that is the house came in or on or towed by a GMC Envoy or a Saab 97X Aero. But of course, General Motors no longer makes a midsize SUV that can tow. And therefore, the logical replacement is actually the Durango. Why not a pickup truck? Well, the answer is actually easy because this is not as long as a pickup truck with similar tow ratings and similar interior seating capacity. At this point, you might be wondering, why don't you just buy a pickup truck? Well, the answer is simply that I prefer a utility vehicle about this size over a pickup truck because I have an enclosed cargo area back here. I can put three rows of people inside the Durango and then I can still tow 7,000 pounds when I need to. And 7,000 pounds is higher than the payload capacity in a pickup truck bed. So if I connect this to my 14 foot box trailer or my 20 foot flatbed trailer or my 20 foot car trailer, I can tow more than I would be able to put in the bed of a pickup truck. Now, obviously, if you live in suburbia, parking a utility vehicle and three or four trailers could be a little bit of a problem. But I'm out here in the forest on nine acres, and so having four trailers really isn't a problem at all. And of course, when you're not towing the trailer, something like the Durango is a little bit easier to park, a little bit more fuel efficient, and a little bit more nimble than a full-size pickup truck. Under the hood, the Durango borrows its V6 and V8 engine, as well as the transmissions from the Ram 1500 pickup truck line. The base V6 is a 3.6 liter model that produces either 293 horsepower or 295 horsepower, depending whether you get the single exhaust or the dual exhaust. Rear wheel drive is standard in the V6, all wheel drive is available, and either one will give you 21 miles per gallon combined. Then we have this engine, which is the one that I chose. It's the 5.7 liter Hemi V8 engine. This produces 360 horsepower when under this hood and 390 pound-feet of torque. That is a little bit lower than what we see in the Ram 1500 pickup truck. As with the V6, rear wheel drive is standard, but I selected the optional all-wheel drive system, which is borrowed from the Jeep Grand Cherokee and gives us a two-speed transfer case. So this does have a low ratio mode, more like traditional body-on-frame SUVs. According to the EPA, fuel economy for the version that I have selected should be right around 17 miles per gallon combined. Now, if this isn't enough power for you, there is, of course, the SRT version of the Durango, and that uses a 6.4 liter V8 engine, producing 475 horsepower. In addition to giving us more power under the hood, the Durango SRT also uses a very aggressive final drive ratio to give you blistering fast zero to 60 times but the fuel economy does suffer and that model will get you right down to around 15 miles per gallon depending on how you treat it. I find the front seats in the Durango to be quite comfortable. These are multi-way power seats with four-way adjustable lumbar support. We have a tilt telescopic steering column that is powered and memory linked and then the passenger seat has the same range of motion as the driver's seat. That's not something we see in all of the competitors. Personally, I found the driver's seat to be more comfortable in the 2019 Kia Sorento. The cushioning is a little bit more comfortable and the extending thigh cushion is a very nice feature for me. However, that's not really a direct competitor to the Durango. It's an awful lot smaller. It's on the small end of the three row crossover segment. And of course the Durango is on the large end of the three row crossover segment. And it's not quite the same kind of vehicle either. I think in reality, the Durango should be compared more to the larger three row crossovers like the Volkswagen Atlas, perhaps the Buick Enclave, Chevy Traverse, and of course the Chevy Tahoe, because this does tow like a Chevy Tahoe. Rear seat legroom is quite generous in the Durango thanks to its overall size. But because this is a rear wheel drive vehicle and we have that longer hood up front than we see in something like a Volkswagen Atlas, the exterior size to interior size is not quite as practical. So you will find more combined legroom and that's front row plus second row plus third row in something like that Atlas. On the other hand, we don't find that much more room in something like a Tahoe or a Suburban because in terms of overall efficiency, they're not packaged quite as well as the Durango. 
The Durango is available as either a six or a seven passenger vehicle. I've actually bought the six passenger vehicle that you can see right here. It has independent captain's chairs right here in the second row. Now there is an option for a center console in the second row. I didn't get it because I think that it's not as handy. If you don't get that center console, you can actually move into the back seat right here between these two seats if you're nimble or just a little skinny, and you can't do that if you have that center console in place. Unlike some of the competition, these seats do not slide forward and backward, and they do not move in a way that allows you to keep a child seat in place and easily get into the third row. That is something that we're starting to see in a number of crossovers out there, but remember that the general design of the Durango dates back to about 2011, so this is before manufacturers were really giving child seats that much thought. However, the seat does fold all the way forward like that so you can put larger cargo in, and then it does flip forward with this webbing right here to allow easy access to the third row, just not when there's a child seat latched into place. Now, I don't have kids, so it's not really a concern for me. The second row seats do recline, and this is in a comfortable position for me. I still have about an inch of legroom left. I also have a decent amount of headroom. If I sit upright back here, the back of my head does touch right back here around the hatch of the vehicle, but above my head, I have about an inch left. If you find yourself frequently using the third row in your crossover, this is one of the more comfortable ones available in this segment. Although keep in mind, this is a six passenger vehicle, so it's not quite as practical as some of those seven passenger crossovers. That's of course because we don't have a three person bench across the rear. Behind this hatch, we find just over 17 cubic feet of storage space. That is behind the third row. Of course, if you have the third row folded, we find a great deal more cargo space than that. That puts this notably above the smaller three row crossovers like the Highlander or the Kia Sorento. With the third row folded, we have a little bit more cargo room in the Durango than we have in the vehicle that this replaces for me, which was a 2009 Saab 97 X Aero. General Motors mid-sized SUVs from that era did have a very wide cargo area in the back, but it was a little bit shorter than this. Dodge gives us a two position tonneau cover. You really have to reach quite far in there in order to use that. Uh, and this can be used either with the third row folded or not to cover your cargo. Under the load floor, we have some additional storage space. You can see that's where I've decided to stow my hitches and balls for my various trailers. This is also where you'll find the jack for the Durango and the spare tire is right there under the vehicle. Moving on to the inside, we have a number of touches that I really appreciated in this interior, like this suede headliner. It's a little bit difficult to see on camera since it is black, but this is an imitation suede. It's actually made of polyester. This is not Alcantara. It's one of the competitors called Dynamica, also made in Italy. We have high adjustable seat belts for the driver and the front passenger, and four-way adjustable headrests. Those tilt forward. These are also anti-whiplash headrests, so the headrest unit itself will actually kind of separate, shoving that brown section forward. I did get the two-tone brown interior. This is part of why it took me so long to get it, because I did end up having to order this. We had a little Dodge logo, those two stripes right there, embroidered into the middle of the seat back. These seats are perforated because they're both heated and ventilated. Moving over to the front doors, we have a soft touch upper section of the door and a soft touch armrest right there as well. It's a bottle holder down there lower on the door and this charcoal section that kind of cruises up to right there by the front of the armrest, that's actually a hard touch plastic down there at the bottom. You'll notice that I did not get the Beats audio system in this particular model. That's personally because I didn't care for the way that the sound was balanced in that particular model and I also didn't need the rear seat entertainment system in my Durango since I don't have any kids. There's also a tweeter right there up higher on the door right by the A pillar that's also covered in that suede material. And then this model has the leather dashboard. Leather dashboards are something that FCA has been doing really a great job on in all of their products, whether we're talking about the Durango or the Chrysler 300 or the Ram series of pickup trucks, etc. It really helps dress up this dashboard because when the Durango launched in 2011, the dashboard was shaped basically like what we're seeing right here, but it didn't have as premium of a look and feel. One of the things that helped seal the deal on the Durango for me was the inclusion of Apple CarPlay in this latest version of the Uconnect software. The Durango now runs basically the latest version of Uconnect that we also see in a variety of other FCA vehicles. When the smartphone integration is operating, you can see we see that right here in the middle that preserves this bottom row of direct access buttons to radio, media, climate, Uconnect apps, etc., as well as the temperature going on and the clock in the middle. 
In addition to adding CarPlay and Android Auto, we now have their latest suite of integrated telematic services enabled by a built-in LTE cell modem. So we have the ability to do the Wi-Fi hotspot, uh, the SOS call, so the car can call out for assistance if you get into an accident, or you can hit that SOS button if you need an ambulance or the police. You can also send destinations to the car using the send and go functionality. Or you can use the Uconnect app on your smartphone to lock and unlock your car remotely, remote start it, and the remote start, and of course, honk the horn and flash the lights if you've lost it in a parking lot. Below the infotainment screen, we find the physical controls for the climate control system. You also see those duplicated up there in Uconnect. If you want to control the rear climate control zone, we just hit that button up there, and then we use the touch screen for controlling that zone. Below those controls, we find two USB inputs, an auxiliary input, and a 12-volt power port. Likely because of the general age of the Durango, these USB ports are not hidden away in the center console, which is my preference. That means you do have to have your cable dangling right there along the center console. Behind that storage cubby, we have two large cup holders. That's a definite improvement for me because our Saab 97X only had one really usable cup holder. We then have a shifter over here on the driver's side. Drive is all the way back there. Manual mode is over to the left. We then push away from the driver for gear down, pull towards the driver for gear up. Behind the shifter, we have the controls for the all-wheel drive system. There's an all-wheel drive auto mode and a low range mode. You'll notice that there is no rear wheel drive only mode, but we do have a little neutral button right there if you want to flat tow your Durango. There's a small storage cubby right there next to it. Between the front seats, we have a padded center armrest. This opens in two different ways. We have one storage tier there that is nice and shallow. You can put something right there if you wanted to, like a smartphone. There is a cutout for that cable and an iPhone 7 Plus will just barely fit right in there with the cable like that. With that divider out of the way, we have a moderately sized storage compartment. Keep in mind, this is a rear wheel drive vehicle, so the transmission is actually kind of under this console, which does limit its overall size. We have a 12 volt power port in there, but not an additional USB port. On the driver's side, we have a partial LCD instrument cluster. The tachometer is a physical element, as is the engine temperature and fuel gauge over there on the right. And then everything else is being delivered by this LCD right there in the middle. The steering wheel should be very familiar to you if you've driven any of Dodge, Ram, Chrysler, or Jeep's recent vehicles. It's a almost three-spoke design with a split bottom spoke right down here, a very thick rim, sections of perforated leather on each side, and then sport grips up top. On the back of the wheel, we have paddle shifters down on the left and up on the right, but these are sort of uh, one-third the size of normal shift paddles. They really are only about an inch tall. They stick up on the top of the steering wheel, but you'll notice not on the bottom of the steering wheel. That's because they still put the track up, down, and volume up, down buttons on the back of the wheel. We have track up, down on the left, volume up, down on the right, and the shift paddles are just right above that. Keeping in mind that the Durango in this trim weighs 5,381 pounds, acceleration in the Durango is absolutely excellent. And that's thanks as much to this 5.7 liter V8 engine, which has an excellent exhaust note to it, as to the ZF 8-speed automatic transmission under the hood. The ZF 8-speed automatic is, in my humble opinion, the absolute best automatic transmission that is made today. And that shouldn't be too surprising, of course, because you will find essentially this same 8-speed automatic transmission under the hoods of Audis, BMWs, Rolls Royces, Bentleys, Jaguars, etc. There's a reason that luxury car companies with big, powerful engines choose ZF automatic transmissions. The shift quality is excellent, the shifts are very fast, and they've proven to be reliable and able to handle a lot of power. That's why we also find a ZF 8-speed automatic transmission, for instance, in the 7 and 800 horsepower Dodges out on the road as well. The difference between a good automatic transmission and an average automatic transmission when it comes to acceleration is easy to demonstrate. Because previous versions of the Durango used a Mercedes-Benz 5-speed automatic transmission, and moving simply from the 5-speed auto to this 8-speed auto and changing essentially nothing else about the vehicle, dropped the 0 to 60 time nearly a full second in this vehicle. The 5.7 second 0 to 60 time that we got out of this RT model is of course notably slower than the SRT version, which will do it well under 5 seconds. They're quoting right around 4.4, 4.5 seconds 0 to 60 for that model. But this is actually faster than the brand new Chevy Tahoe RST. Interestingly enough, this is also faster 0 to 60 than the twin turbocharged Ford Explorer. Because of the overall design of the vehicle, and especially the transmission that we find in the Explorer Sport, it's actually about a half second slower 0-60 to 60 than the Durango. 
Although this utility vehicle masks its high curb weight well in its acceleration runs, braking scores do show the weight of it. In our tests, we stop from 60 miles an hour back to zero in 128 feet, which is a little on the long side for the three row crossover segment. You will definitely stop shorter in something like a Mazda CX-9 or even a Toyota Highlander. Now that could be helped a little bit aftermarket because the tires in this vehicle are not as grippy as they could be. If you put performance street truck tires on this, then you could get better stopping distances. Weight obviously has an effect on handling, but the Durango does fairly well here because of the excellent weight balance we have in this utility vehicle. That's because of the rear wheel drive layout. Rear wheel drive cars have better weight balances because the engine can be mainly behind the front axle. And when you take a look at where the transmission is located, it's actually right next to me in the vehicle. It's not up there under the hood. That shifts a lot of weight to the rear of the car. The V6 version of the Durango has a near perfect 50-50 weight balance, and the V8 version is a little bit more front heavy than that, but the difference is not huge, and this is not as imbalanced as something like a Toyota Highlander or a Honda Pilot or even a Ford Explorer. The CX-9 feels a little bit smaller out on the road, it feels a little bit tighter on those winding mountain roads, and that's logical because it does weigh about 1,200 pounds less. In overall grip, this obviously is going to fall below the CX-9, however, this does very well for itself, and I'm going to have to give this an extra boost in terms of its overall score because this is the last rear wheel drive entry in this category. And if you like the way a rear wheel drive vehicle feels out on the road, there really is no substitute. This is going to feel very different than a CX-9 or an Explorer or anything else in this particular segment. This is going to be much more engaging to drive, even if it is not going to hold the road quite as well. Out on rougher roads like this, the ride is well polished. And even though we're in the RT trim, which is ostensibly one of the sportier trims of the Durango, I'm still going to give this a B when it comes to the overall ride. The ride is overall a little bit firmer than some of the very soft cross Crossovers in this segment, and that is to be expected with a tow rating of 7,200 pounds in this particular model. The suspension needs to be firmer in this vehicle, especially in the rear, in order to be able to support the payload and the tongue weight that this vehicle is capable of. As I said before, the Durango has a fully independent suspension, and that helps out the ride as well, because this does not feel unsettled over broken pavement like a solid axled vehicle could, like my former GMC Envoy, or for instance a Chevy Tahoe, depending on the road surface that you're on. Back out on the paved road, the Durango does fairly well in long highway driving situations. However, when the road starts getting rougher like this, the firmness of the suspension is noticeable. That means that if you're looking for a soft Lexus RX style ride, you will need to look somewhere else. This is not going to be the vehicle for you. In our cabin noise test at 50 miles an hour, this scored 71 decibels, so I'm going to give this a B in terms of overall cabin noise. We do get a little bit more engine noise in this V8 version than we get in the V6 version, and that's likely why the score is a little bit higher here. The V8 engine in the Durango employs a cylinder deactivation system in order to help improve fuel economy. And when that cylinder deactivation system is in operation, the harmonics change a little bit on the exhaust for the engine, and that means that things get a little bit louder in the cabin. Although it is noticeable, I wouldn't describe it as annoying. If you do want to disable that, you can hit the Eco Off button in the center console, and that will disable the cylinder deactivation system. Engaging the Sport Mode in the center console changes the way the vehicle responds to your throttle inputs, and it also disables that cylinder deactivation system as well. The harmonics involved in operating a V8 engine in four-cylinder mode are why we don't see four-cylinder mode over all engine RPMs. For instance, if you're just idling at a stoplight, all eight cylinders are in operation. It's not going to deactivate four of them because they think that'll sound a little bit peculiar. But when traveling along and demands on the engine are moderate to light, the system can deactivate those four cylinders to help improve fuel economy. And that's how we've managed to average 19 miles per gallon over a week of mixed driving with this vehicle. Now, if you include the time that we spent towing in the Durango, then that overall average drops down to 15 miles per gallon, which is actually still better than the 6 liter V8 that's under the hood of my Saab 97 Aero. That tends to average about 12 to 13 miles per gallon over a very similar driving cycle as this. And keep in mind that the Saab 97X Aero is considerably lighter than the Durango. It's more than a thousand pounds lighter. Instead of our usual pricing and comparison section, let's do things a little bit differently here. The red Durango that we're looking at right here, which is again my Durango that I actually bought with my very own money, had an MSRP just over $57,000. As it is, even before any applicable discounts, I actually consider that to be a pretty good deal because there are very few SUVs like this that can tow over 7,000 pounds. In fact, if you want to tow that kind of weight with your SUV, you really are pretty limited to things like an Expedition or a Sequoia or a Chevy Tahoe or Chevy Suburban 
or luxury entries like the QX80 or BMW X5, Mercedes-Benz GLE, and of course the Audi Q7. The reason that we see those higher towing capacities in the BMW, the Mercedes, and the Audi is that their overall design is actually very close to what we see in this Dodge right here. Interestingly enough, the Mercedes of this same era was actually co-designed with the Durango and the Grand Cherokee, so that really does tell you a bit what's going on under the hood. Those vehicles all have available powerful engines under the hood. The Audi and the BMW use basically the same ZF 8-speed automatic transmission under that section. And even though they're all unibody vehicles, they're all unibody vehicles that were designed with towing in mind. And that's what separates this from something like a Volkswagen Atlas or a Ford Explorer or a Honda Pilot or my favorite at the small end of the three-row crossover segment, the 2019 Kia Sorento. Obviously, there is a penalty to be paid for the higher towing capacity we see in the Durango versus the larger three-row crossovers like the Enclave, Traverse, CX-9, etc. The Durango is heavier than those options, and that does reduce your fuel economy. It also has an impact on your handling. So depending on the driving surface that you're on, exactly from the factory, this won't handle like a CX-9. The CX-9 will definitely handle better. Of course, we do have the ability in the Durango to put much larger tires on the front and on the back because the Durango SRT has 295 with tires front and rear standard. So I've actually ordered those wheels and tires for my Durango, so I'll let you know how that improves the handling. Be sure and follow us over at facebook.com slash alexandautos. With a 5.7 liter V8 engine under the hood, obviously fuel economy is another compromise but it's not as big of a compromise as you might think, because it's really not that big of a problem to average 17 miles per gallon, which is what the EPA says we should get in this model. And if you're on a longer highway trip, averaging 20 miles per gallon on that highway journey is not really a problem in the Durango either, as long as you're not towing. That puts this actually not that far behind the larger three-row crossovers like the Volkswagen Atlas or even the fuel-efficient Mazda CX-9. The bigger downside for me is that due to the relative age of the Durango and the basic vehicle is about eight years old now, we don't find the same level of gadgets and convenience features, etc., available in this cabin that we do find in some of the competition. So there is simply no competition to the large LCD instrument cluster that we find in the Volkswagen Atlas. We don't have extending thigh cushions like we find in the Kia Sorento. We don't find second row seats that will let you flip and fold them forward with a child seat latched into place like we find in some of those other competitors as well. And we don't find quite as much cargo room behind the third row as we find in something like a Ford Explorer or the Volkswagen Atlas. But none of those can tow. That towing ability really is what continues to separate the Durango from the competition. Again, that's the reason that I bought this, and that's the reason that Durango sales have been surprisingly steady year after year. And with that, and before the rain gets any harder, that is our look at the 2018 Dodge Durango. Be sure and let me know what you think about this down there in the comment section below. Hit that subscribe button down there at the bottom of your screen. You can also check out the related videos on our channel, especially our top picks in the three-row crossover segment, whether we're looking at large crossovers or small crossovers or big crossovers. The Durango is still definitely at the top of my personal shopping list, as you can imagine, since I just bought one right here. But there are also some excellent options out there if you don't need the towing capacity that we find in this vehicle. I'll see you next week.